most interested in when I look at artwork is what the artist brings to the table. I'm very much, in, like, I really want to know what it is that the artist is, is thinking and why the artist is making the work they make. So we can go to the next one. I think I will have to take this higher. So a lot of my work is about looking. It's about watching and looking. Um, and it's about deciphering an encounter. my work from a place of love, I make it from a place of um, pleasure, I make it from a place of pain, discomfort, and confusion. I try to work out my own confusion through my work. And it really helps me kind of figure out where I am, what I need, what I'm thinking, uh, where I want to go. Um, so um, I used to watch, I was just one off. Just leave a blank person. I used to watch my mother dress when I was a little girl. And that's really little. I used to like sit on, the, on her bed when she was getting ready to go out. And she would go from a nice woman woman to this creature, this gorgeous creature. Like I would watch her come out of the shower, you know, and she'd put on, this is the olden days, like in the 60s, and she would put on um, her bra, you know, they wore those big white ones, and those big, and those big white underwears, and um, and all of a sudden, like her stomach would be pulled in, she had a girdle. And at a certain point, I remember she had this yellow dress, this canary yellow dress with short sleeves and buttons. And I would watch her put it on, and all of a sudden, like, wow. I couldn't believe it. She had turned into like a vision. You know, and I went into put her lipstick on, and literally would become somebody else. You know, I, 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 it was incredible. She was, she was a beautiful woman, but the way, but in my eyes, she was a queen. And, um, I wanted to be close to her. Like, I really wanted to be close to her so I could watch. Um, even like we'd be sitting in the car sometimes, and I'd be sitting in the back seat, we'd drive through the bank, we'd be in these drive through banks in those days. And like right as we got to the bank, and we'd be waiting in line, and she would put on her lipstick. And she would turn into somebody else. It was, it was an amazing thing. I tell you these stories, these sort of stupid stories, because I think that that really has something to do with how I photograph and why I photograph, and why mostly through the camera I'm really fascinated by watching, just like looking. And so most of my work is made from a place where the two of us, the person in front of me, and then I sit there and look at each other, and we just like we watch each other, and we get to know each other, and I get to know who they are, and they get to know who I am, and some some sort of way we become close. And so my work is so much about longing, and I think. A lot of it comes from like longing for my mother at a very young age and wanting to be so close that we would never be separated. Taking pictures of someone, taking a portrait of someone literally puts you in that place, like this very, very intimate space. And so I think ultimately what I'm really doing is creating a very intimate space, a, little, a place where the two of us can be, can be very, very close, almost as if we're one. Um, so we can look at the next slide. Oh, right, that's me. Yeah, yeah, that's me. Um, it's, it's endlessly fascinating for me to put someone in front of my camera and just to sit there and watch them. Um, and so I'm going to start with these new series I did with my two latest series. One is called Sleeping Beauty, and the other one is called Promised Land. And Sleeping Beauty is, um, well, for one thing, it draws on my early experiences with my mother. It's almost as if in, my, in all of my work, and I, I'm guessing that this is fairly common, we all like sort of recycle childhood memories. Like that's kind of we, what we sort of, we return them over and over again, and we try to figure something out. Um, and so it's, when I say it's endlessly fascinating, it's endlessly fascinating because I'm always learning about myself when I take photographs. And as much as I make portraits, and portraits is what I'm known for, I always say that my photographs aren't, my portraits aren't really faithful documents. I mean, I look and I'm very sensitive to who they are, and certainly a lot of them comes through, but um, they're not, I don't think 
think they're faithful documents of the person I'm photographing. They're really much more about, it's like as if you've, I don't know if you know, you guys do Venn diagrams and, and over here. It's like there's these two circles and there's a place in between. I feel like my portraits are in the middle, like where my personality and my vulnerabilities intersect with their personality and their vulnerabilities. Um, so, um, so what I'm doing when I'm photographing is I am establishing an intimate connection. Um, so in this particular series that I call Sleeping Beauty, Sleeping Beauty stands for, um, it's, it's about that, it's like a metaphor for that kind of fragile and ferocious strength that we keep hidden inside of us. And that we, so that somehow keep the, the peace that we hide from the world, that really if we brought it up and we brought it out, it would really be our full, whole, strong selves. So Sleeping Beauty kind of stands for that peace that's sleeping. A sort of sleeping giant in a way. So it's kind of a, like an irony, an ironic kind of a thing. So, my work is about, if I had to sort of say what it's about, I would say that it's about secrets and it's about the things that we hide. It's about the things I hide, the things I've hidden all my life, the things I never wanted to talk about. And the strangest thing is, is that when I photograph someone else, I get this really strange feeling that I understand theirs too. I don't understand them in a way that I could talk about them. I couldn't tell you what their secrets were. I couldn't tell you like what they're thinking. But when someone is, is standing there or sitting there or laying down there in front of my camera, I, um, I feel like I know them. I feel like there's something that happens between us that's so intimate and so personal that I understand something very, very basic about who they are. I understand a piece of their soul, and it's that piece that's, that I understand as my piece, too. It's that piece where our, piece, where our soul sort of intersects. And so in this one, I'm photographing women. I've been photographing women for a long time. I think I've always photographed women, except that it's been sprinkled with men, because I didn't really realize that women were what I was kind of fascinated by, which I think now, thinking on upon it, it really has a lot to do with my mother, and with the fact that I'm a woman and that I'm fascinated by women because they remind me of me in some ways. But um, this particular series is about women, and it is a lot about how a lot of us have been kind of trained to um, kind of hide like a lot of our strengths, kind of keep them sort of a little bit like underground, like without, so we don't completely bring them out and use them because being too strong is sometimes, well, it's not that it is dangerous, I think it feels dangerous. Um, and so, I think the other piece that you'll see as we look at the inside of slideshow is um, that there is a sense in all my work that there are spaces between us. That the, and it's those spaces, those secrets, those things that we hide that we don't discuss that I think I'm photographing. It's almost like the spaces between us is what you kind of see, is that certain look in their faces where they're kind of knowing, they're kind of vulnerable and they're kind of knowing, they're kind of strong, they're kind of afraid. There's all these little pieces in their, in their faces. Um, and it's all the pieces that I understand. Um, just looking back on my notes, the things I forgot to say is, I make, this is what I wrote, I said, I make pictures about the things that I was afraid of as a child and about what I wanted most. I make pictures about that which I sought from others and what they required of me. I photograph what I knew, but I needed to hide. Um, so in some ways, all of my work is an interpretation of longing, love, discomfort, confusion, and fear. And again, sort of back to this, in these, these images of Sleeping Beauty, I think one of the other things that these particular works are about, all of the women are laying on the ground, for the most part, they're laying on the ground, they're vulnerable, but, while, but in their vulnerability, there's also a kind of awareness, like they know, and they know that there's something that they should be able to kind of 
summon a certain kind of strength you should be able to summon and kind of bring up. Um, so there is a sense of vulnerability, but there's also a sense of, of awareness. Um, and it's, I guess it's really about those vulnerabilities that we kind of keep hidden because we don't want to expose them. But that's the video. These actually have sound to them. Is there some way I can put sound on this? Mm -hmm. No? Oh, you can hear it in the videos. Um, you can hear them, um, like the grass and the wind. It's like these nature sounds. Um, in these images, too, because of the way these women are all laying on the ground, um, I'm, I'm exploring the roles of power and trust also. As the photographer, clearly I'm the one with all the power. You know, I, I have the camera, I have the ability to control the work, I have the ability to make them look, I suppose, the way I want them to look. Um, and so there is this, I'm the, I'm the, I become in some ways the authority position. I take the, ma the masculine sort of role. So I, I'm kind of working with this whole notion of power and trust. So. I, I am the person with the camera, I am the person with the control. At the same time, I completely sort of understand the role of being the woman on the ground, the one that's on the ground. So there's all these like, flipping, and, and again, you'll see this in all of my work, there is a sense that we, I, I go back and forth between having the power and, and, and wanting the power and being the person who's being photographed, and literally identifying. Because that's, I tend to identify with the person that's, that's photographing also. I'll explain that a little more as we go on. If I click mine, will we shoot forward? Um, and so uh, while I'm photographing, well, I mean, I'm doing the Sleeping Beauty, I'm also simultaneously working on a, pro on a, on a series called uh, Promise Me, which is, you know, goes hand in hand. It's also about women, it's also about the things we hide, and about the way they, the way they, um, Kind of keep us down. It's, it's a certain amount of so. I, it's, it's, kind of, it's almost like I'm showing the, the shame and and, and, the, and the, the things that we have kind of showing them literally on their faces. There are these little you know, you can see this, these little pieces of, 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 uh, of uh, smeared lipstick. So in Promised Land, I'm using smears and stains and spills as metaphors for um, the things we hide. The things that keep us from standing up, from being, you know, all we want to be, from being as powerful as we want to be. Um, it's almost as if um, each one of these women is suspended between um, the desire to communicate and the fear of being exposed. It's that place, you know, where we, we kind of walk that tightrope of wanting to communicate and being afraid to say. To, uh, to expose, you know, basically uh, keeping our strengths kind of hidden. So there's smears, there's stains, there's spills in these series, and they're all like metaphors for this. So this one is a video. And in the videos here, I'm, they're literally, I, you watch them literally smear themselves. This one, it does have a really interesting sound. She's like clicks the lipstick and it, 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 it does. No? This one is on my website. You can see it on my website. You can, you can hear the noises it makes. It, yeah, it does make a difference. Okay, so now. Yeah.
This one goes on for a while. Maybe just go to the next one. I think there's another one. Yeah. Maybe she should go to the next one. Yeah. This one is part of a four part series. This is probably part number three. She's already kind of started it a little bit. And then she just kind of looks at you, you know, she's just looking at you with all her, her fears kind of written on her face. And this is part of the series. Uh, one of the things is um, that some of my work is, a lot of my work is influenced by old painting, old Dutch and Italian painting, and that's um, part of like these, these black backgrounds. I'll show you later when I have a few slides of, of older paintings. Um, I'm, I'm very much influenced by that work. I love the sort of severity of it, the simplicity of it, the dark backgrounds, where all of the focus is completely on one of the expressions of these women, their emotions. So the exploration of who we are and what we want to become, is there ever any other subject? I think that's um, a good uh, talking about my work. So just to go back now a little bit, so I made black and white work for about 20 years. Um, something that, all the way up to about 2005, I was making exclusively black and white work. I was making mostly portraiture. Um, and I was always interested in that whole notion of just watching people and, and who they were I think that my photographs have always been um, about evidence for me, about evidence that I exist. They, they were a way for me to literally prove that, like, I saw things the way I saw things. That, like, that I, I, I was a real person. That I, I, I that I existed really. That, I, that I, what I saw was actually the way I saw it. Um, this one, um, you know, just sort of straightforward, it happens to be my daughter who's sitting right there, but you know, very much about like, you know, here I am and here it is and I see this and this is real. And you can't tell me it's not real. <laughs> um, my one and my son over here, yeah. um, when they were little kids, um, we, my parents came to the, not to this country, to the United States um, to finish their degrees. Um, coming, they came over temporarily from Greece, um, completely just for a couple of years. While they were there, they had me and they had my sister. Like, boom, boom, they had us right away. And we immediately moved back to Greece, fully intending to live in Greece for the rest of our lives. We were there until I was about five and a half. So basically what happened was like, I, got, I was born in one country, I kind of got yanked to another country. It was, it was actually kind of traumatic for me. We went there, by the time I was like, I think it was like five and a half or so, we came back to the States. My father decided he didn't want to practice medicine in Athens, in Greece. So we came back. And I found myself in kindergarten around October, and I didn't speak English, um, which again was, was extremely traumatic. It was just this way of like kind of crossing cultures at a time when it was just a, these formative years for me. And um, I was a, a really quiet child. I was really shy. I used to read a lot, and I used to read to kind of figure out how to fit in, you know, how to, how, how, how to act, how to really like understand like, what people were like. And um, I, you know, I always felt like this kind of lost child. Again, this is not a picture of my son as much as an image, of, a metaphor of how it seemed, you know, felt to me. To feel this way. Um, and so I'm going to quickly go through a, through a few of my old series. This one was part of the show that Joanna had up in March. 
Right. Uh, these were just 20 by 20 inch pieces. Um, and this was from a series from 1995. I was, um, we were visiting my sister in, in, in Italy for the summer. She, she was in Italy, we were visiting, it was a very, very hot summer. And I was pregnant with my third child. Um, I was pregnant with my third child and my father was dying of cancer. So it was a time of both like, really like, I was both hopeful of, the, of, the, of, the, of this new life inside of me and I was also you know, desperately sad um, about the impending death of my father. And so I took these kind of funny pictures, whoops, these, these sort of strange pictures. They were kind of a combination of still life and portraiture. And this is when I began to incorporate like the natural landscape into it. Um, so I called this one at the gate I called this one, uh, I think it was Legs and Pears, or Pears and Legs, um, Anna with Pine Cones. I think there's something about these images that's sort of very still. It was very, very hot that summer. I was feeling very afraid and very um, claustrophobic, and I wasn't sure like how to feel. Should I feel good? Should I feel bad? How do you combine the sense of like impending death with all this, this like brand new life that's coming through? Um, this one was called Glowing Bucket. Um, that was the summer of 1995, and my father died that Christmas. And then that next summer, we went, 96, we went to Greece, and, and, and I made a series of photographs. Um, I just have one of them, but it was from a series called My Father's Lands Revisited, where we, um, I took pictures in the village where my father came from. I was basically trying to find things about my father that I didn't understand. And so this is my niece. Um, I call this the stone necklace. But it was taken on the beach where, I mean, all these pictures are places where my father walked, and this was taken on the beach where my father learned how to swim, and where he had subsequently taught me how to swim as well. Um, summer, this is, a, this is from another series called the Brazil series. The next summer, in 97, we went to Brazil. I had had a student, actually, who was Brazilian, and she invited us to her home for a month, so we went and spent this wonderful month in Brazil. And I was, again, somehow influenced by the landscape there. The landscape has always held a great amount of, of, of interest for me. Um, and this one I call Icarus. This is, again, of Lucas over here. Um, it's called Icarus. Um, it was about the boy who flew too close to the sun and the danger of flying too high. Um, this one was called Voodoo. There was a lot of like voodoo in Brazil. They, they believed in all kinds of really kind of weird things. And my mother used to also from Greece, uh, she was Greek from like the Turkish part of like the Turkish, I mean, she was Greek, but they were the Greeks from Turkey. And there were a lot of superstitions that ran in that family too. And that, those things all kind of crossed my mind and kind of became part of these photographs. This was a little diptych I did from the Brazil series. I called this one a shield and I called this one a thin line. Um, but my children at this point were really sick of me and really didn't want to be in my pictures anymore. And they were finished. I couldn't bribe them any longer. I used to bribe them in all sorts of ways, and they had had it. And, and you can see it basically right around 1999. I had also reverted to a. Um, I was use, I had been using a medium format camera. I reverted to a large format camera. What I didn't mention is I use entirely only film. Like all of my work is film. So I had moved to a large format camera, which is a view camera, the kind of camera that you, you know, go underneath a hood, you have, you know, it's, it's slow, it's a very slow process with sheet film. They were not having much to do with it. These are the two younger ones, now my daughter and the little one. And um, what happens was I was just photographing limbs. They were really pulling out. And you can see in this whole series, they, 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 their faces were just not, they were not giving me good faces. So I was kind of <laughs> <laughs> They were just attitude, you know, all over the place. Um, um, and at a certain point, they were like, we have had it. You're not even doing our hands and legs anymore. <laughs> so for about five years, from about 2000 to about 2005, I spent a long period of time making still lifes. Um, conceptual still lives. At this point, I had three little kids. Um, you know, it was, I was teaching. I, we live on a farm. We have all this like farm work to do. So I really didn't have much time to work except when these kids were napping. And I had this tiny studio that was probably the size of this room. And I set a piece of fabric on the ground and I used to pour stuff on it dirt and powder and sticks and all kinds of stuff. And um, I did a number of series of still lives. All of, not all, but some of them were on my, on my website. This particular one was a series that occupied me for two years. 
It was something I could do when they were napping. I would run down to my studio and I was collecting three things. I was collecting chocolate, baker's chocolate. I was collecting um, hair that fell from my head when I blow dried my hair. I would like fall on the ground. I would roll it up, like roll it up into a ball, and then like put it into a box. And I photographed and I collected it for two years, three, two years, and uh, lint from my dryer, which was literally the lint from my kids and my husband's um, clothing. So in a way, I was still photographing my kids, but it was like the remains of their clothing. <laughs> And so basically every so often I would gather it up and I would photograph, you know, make piles of chocolate, hair, and lint separately. So I called these portions, so it was like three portions and maybe 12 portions and um, I don't know how many portions, 160 portions, whatever it was. And then I was also collecting hairs that I rolled up into little balls. I mean, honestly, there was a woman who cleaned for me, and she, she one day, she, I, I, I used to put these balls, like, next to my blow dryer, and one day I came up, and I was like, oh, Nancy, like, did you see that ball of hair? And she's like, well, yeah, I threw it. It's like, oh, no, this is, like, part of my, this is part of my art project. I was very particular about the hair. I, like, if I was on vacation, it didn't count. If someone else wanted to give me hair, like, I didn't want it, it was like, no, 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 this is very specific. Um... This was, you know, like, a, I, don't, I don't know how many. I call these blows for blow dry. So, like, 160 blows or something. I <laughs> Someone told me I needed to think of a schnazzy name. <laughs> blow dries. And then cycles. I called these cycles. These were the, the lint dryer. Anyway, I mean, I'm not showing you all of them. There's many, many more. But this is sort of the way they would grow. I would arrange them. And I would photograph them. And they just started getting closer. They get this, the pile kept getting closer and closer. This was the biggest pile. And it got closer and closer to my view camera, which was pointed down. Um, and this was one of the ways that it's been hung. I've shown it in a number of different ways. But this was one of the ways. And these were about 20 by 24 inch the, the images and then plus the frames. So, um, so I did that until about 2005, and then in 2005 I thought to myself, um, you know, like I, I spend so much time in the dark room, and I only ever have, I, I'm always like months and months behind. If I switch to color, color, it's got to be easy. Like I didn't really know how to do color, but it's got to be easy because like you just send it out. So I thought one day I pulled out my view camera and I bought a pack of film. And I called my, like, again, my daughter and my younger son, and then we had our Italian cousins visiting for the summer, and a friend of theirs, and they were out playing, and I was like, will you guys come and just post for me just for a few minutes, I want to do a color test. And this was, like, literally my first color photo. I just asked, and the kids were like, well, what do you want us to do? And I was like, I don't know, maybe, could you just, just kind of stand there? And they stood there, and... Um, I was like, whoa, that's kind of interesting. And so I just said, well, maybe if you could move back a little and you could just turn to the side and you could just move over. I mean, I didn't say much because if I direct, it really gets not good. I mean, I'm really interested in watching what they do. And I, I took like 10 pictures, you know, 10 pieces of film. And when the, I got the pictures back, I was like fascinated. First of all, with the fact that I could do color because the color was so beautiful and I had never, I mean, I don't, my house is like black and white. I mean, honestly, there's like no color. I wear black. And like a, color isn't part of what I do. So this was kind of fascinating. And, and also, I, I was so fascinated by the fact that even though they were just standing there, it seemed as if like these kids, they're a very close bunch. I mean, these kids are very, very tight and know each other and have a long history together. But it seemed like as much as they were together, they were also very separate. They were very alone at the same time. They were both together and alone. And that was kind of interesting. So I started inviting other people to my farm, uh, which is another thing maybe I didn't mention. All of my work is made on the 70 acres that I live on. It's a farm that we inherited from my father, who had bought this farm as an investment um, in 1968. He had come from Greece. He had grown up on a farm in a village in Greece. Um, um, and he, they had lost everything. He had lived through two wars. They had lived through World War II, and then they had lived through the, Europe, uh, the, the Greek Civil War right after that. And so my parents had lost everything. So my father was like, he didn't know anything about stocks, but he's like, I know if I buy a piece of land, like, it's there. It's not going anywhere. And so we, I mean, we bought it for my dad, but anyway. Um, so my work also, the backstory is that it's all about home. It's all about home and love and trust and relationships and time. So, uh, so 
I ended up, and I didn't really understand this at the time, I did it for three years, from 2005 to 2008, but I, I started inviting people and asked them to bring the people that they had a history with, which ended up being mostly family. And I, again, really just through gut instinct, just started watching them, and I, I, mean, I would go to portfolio reviews like in 2006, like a year in, and it really, I, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what I was doing. It was just, I kept saying, I'm really interested in watching them. I, I, I know they come in with a history, but I, it, it, it's take, it always takes me years. That's why the first two series are harder for me to talk about still, because I, I can really love them. But um, I, I, I know now that I'm really, really interested in this notion of like families and watching people together and how people interact together, how, how people see one another, how people see themselves in relationship to other people. Like all of that is very much about what interests me. You know, how they've interrupted. Like in this one, I mean, I think it's kind of interesting that the younger woman puts a calming hand on the shoulder of the older woman. It seems like it should be the other way around. Um, but this one seems a little bit more exciting. Um, this one I called Sisters. There was a third sister, and this was the only picture that she wasn't in, and I felt horribly guilty not including the third <laughs> sister. But this was the picture that worked for me. Um, you know, for me, these, this one was a student of mine, and she brought her sister, and I, I did not ask them to wear fancy dresses. I just did. Um, but they remind me of my sister and I when we were little. My mother used to dress us in really fancy dresses and pick pictures of us. And we would stand there like all nerd like and like kind of like, oh. And my mother would be like, smile! And we'd be like, oh, you know, and we'd be uncomfortable and we didn't want to smile. Um, only these two are just so much more savvy than my sister and I were. My sister and I were like afraid to say anything, but these two are like almost as if they don't trust the way that photographer is going to represent them. Like there's this sense of kind of mistrust or like just not quite sure that I like it. <laughs> <laughs> <That's really nice. laughs> That's the picture that hits my mind when I <laughs> Yeah. I used to have eczema, so I would always keep my hands like this, you know, so you couldn't see it. It's really so sad. Um, this one was called Portrait of a Young Man sort of mostly focused on him, but again, it's a family. And, um, I, it's, you know, for me, this image talks to the point of how one member in the family often carries the weight of the family, you know, most visibly. And this one happens to be my husband and son who are sitting in this room. Uh, most of my photographs of adult children and their parents are very much about separating, about the separation that has to happen, that inevitable separation. Is another one, a mother and daughter. You know, you can sort of see the similarities and the differences. And she's so restrained, and she's and the mom's really like out there, and yet you can also see that on some level, at some point, I sense that she's going to be just as strong as her mom. So it's called Pam. This one has a long kind of interesting history. I mean, this the middle one was a student of mine. She. Had, they had come to one of my openings, and I was like, wow, I'd love to photograph you guys. And it ended up that these two girls had been separated from their mother at very young. Um, I think they were different fathers, obviously they were different fathers. Um, they had just kind of come together, and they had just started to like, meet up again. It was, it was kind of a painful story. And to be honest, I felt terrible pushing the mom back there, but I, 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 I couldn't get the picture if she was up front. And I could see she wasn't happy. Um, and those are the kinds of things that make me feel bad because I, I honestly care. I care when I'm taking pictures. I don't want you to feel bad. Um, I called this one Amy Lipsiewski and her sister. And for me, this image is so much about how one sister is looking and the other one's got her eyes closed. Like how some members of the family are literally like see what's going on and others of us close our eyes to, to um, what's happening. Um, so one of the things that I have done and I continue to do is I go from like whatever the parameters are of a particular body of work I'm working on, after I'm done with it and I feel like I'm just, I, 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 I've exhausted this topic, I want to do something to challenge myself. And so I went from group photographs, horizontal, outside, to interior uh, studio photographs with one person, with a, this is actually a square format camera. Um, 
and I started this by chance. This was the little Italian nephew who was visiting one night for dinner. We were sitting out back, and he was wearing that blouse, that T-shirt, and um, he had the he had that little. I had put the melon next to him because I was going to cut it up for dessert. But as he was sitting there at dinner, I, thought, I said to my, and my cello, you look so good with that melon. I said, you know, we're not going to have this for dessert. We're going to have something else. And I said, tomorrow I'm taking you into the studio, and I'm going to put you in front of this thing. I hear you know, kicking and screaming. He, he came in. Um, he took, and he goes, well, what do you want me to do? I said, I, I don't know. I, I just, I don't know. I just have a sense. I just kind of, just, would you just sit there for me? And he did. And he ran out afterward. He ran out of the studio. I was like, okay, I'm going to just try this again, because the picture came back, and it was really interesting. And so then I, I picked some men from the garden, I pulled out my daughter, I was like, could you do this for me too? And I did this for a year. I started inviting people I knew, people, friends of friends, just people, and um, I would have an array of things in my studio, whatever was available at the market. And, um, well, and I, for a year, I photographed people holding different kinds of food. Um, I probably obvious by now. My influences do come. A lot of my influences, old Dutch and Italian painting, just that sort of sort of simple, severe focus on face and and and, and, and um, expression. And I saw, and I also really, really, I've always been fascinated since I was a little girl by these old paintings um, of like what seemed to me as a child the reality of where food comes from, you know, rather than all that packaged food that we eat. I mean, the reality was that, that these are like real things that get kind of killed and, and this, this is more real. Because I've all, I'm always interested in what goes on underneath. I've always been interested in the underside of things rather than just what looks like on the surface. And so for me, I thought they were just a little humorous too because they're a combination of portraiture and still life. Um, and the expressions are all, they vary. Um, some of them are defiant, some of them are more uh, 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 fragile, you know, sensitive. They kind of run together. Um, sometimes you see the emotion, you know, in the way they're holding the food. I think if you asked me um, about portraiture, people often say to me, well, why don't you just do self-portraits? And I say, well, I do. Like, to me, these are self-portraits. You see them, you know, each series really kind of wants to be seen as a group, as a series, because as a series, they, they speak of a story. And the story is often this, this variety of emotions that I feel like are all emotions that, that are all make up, you know, my entire sense. And they can run from you know defiant to sad to angry to loving to gentle to 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 submissive. Um, this comes from another series I did in two thousand. So that 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 the last series was called Falling from Grace. Falling from Grace is kind of like you. It referred to the notion of how you dropping other people's expectations to become your own self. You have to kind of, sometimes you just have to break from what people expect from you and just do what it is that you think you need to do. Then, so then in 2000, that was 2009, 2010, 2011, I worked on a series called Something Like Love, and I photographed, again, um, people asking them to bring whoever they wanted. This was a fairly short series. And then in 2012, I, I wanted to, I decided to stop this one because it felt a little bit too similar to my last one. And I, I was up in, I had just read a book, there's a book called um, The Sergeant's Daughters. It's about this John Singer Sergeant painting. It's an entire novel on the psychology of this painting. It's, it's pretty fascinating about this, these four sisters and their mother and their, their very flamboyant mother and how John Singer Sergeant saw these four little girls and almost predicted the future in a way. So incredibly precious, um, so sensitive. So I went up to Boston to see this painting, it's big. And when I was up there, there was like two rooms in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston of all his paintings and I was fascinated. And I was just about to start a new series. 
And so the reason this is the reason that my work is called After Sergeant, mostly because I was so interested in his um, in his ability to really kind of hone in on other people's psyches, um, and that's you know what fascinates me. So these were two sisters, twins actually, from the series After Sergeant. This, this one was, a, this is from a series called Ghost Portraits, which Joanna has shown, which is up here right now. Um, there's, there's like a whole series of them. These images were done for a few years on the side. I was making these pictures whenever I didn't have a model. Um, often in the winter when like I couldn't go outside, but also just because I didn't have models, and I would look outside and I'd see this beautiful fog or this like light mist that was sort of a little bit like what you guys get here. And um, it was so beautiful and I was like, like, I really need to photograph this light. So I would take my backdrops, which were the same backdrops that I'm using. These are actually all outdoor pictures, but I have a lot of fabric out, uh, backdrops. So I would take these backdrops, I would jump into this little cart we have with my big boots and my cameras, and I would run out and I would drive out into the fields. And I, I also took the stands, that, that, like the backdrop stands for my photography. And I would position them out there and just make these shapes and photograph them. And um, I did this for a while just as, a, just as an exercise, but I, they went on for about three years until I realized I had a whole series of them. And I ended up calling them ghost portraits um, as sort of an homage to my father, who, um, again, this farm was something that was like, you know, came from my father, kind of handed down to us from my father. Um, and when we first moved there, we had moved in from New York City to raise the kids like out, out in the country. The farmers out in Pennsylvania like basically decimate their trees. They don't like to have any trees on the you know because there's, they, they bring weeds and stuff. So, but when we came back, I mean the farm is still farm, but we took out took certain areas like around the outside, and we we basically took some land back to grow trees. And for ten years, ten to eleven years, we planted like a thousand seedlings every year. Um, and my and my father and my husband and I and the kids sometimes would kind of tag along and help us plant them. And my thoughts were, you know, by the time these kids are in high school, this is going to be incredible, and they're going to be so proud. They'll bring their friends, and it'll be beautiful. Um, and I mean, it did. It did grow, and it, and it is beautiful. But my father never lived to see it. My father like, died before the little one was even born. Um, so. Um, yeah, so I call them ghost pictures. Um, there's like all this presence and absence, which I think, interestingly enough, is kind of also visible in all my work. A kind of presence and absence. It's, it's kind of an homage to like how much he taught me about the land. And um, about family. Uh, this is how it was hung in, in, in the first time we showed all of this. So it's, it, it was kind of interesting because it really was a side project that ended up becoming something. And that happens to me sometimes. Um, and while I was doing ghost portraits, I was also doing this one that I ended up calling Longing in Black. Again, similar very much to my whole sense of like watching my mother and, and really watching my very beautiful but distant mother, and really wanting to be close. And this is this really strange way that, you know, those of you who are photographers might know, or even portrait photographers, this, this thing happens, this like very intimate connection happens, and it may be brief, it's like this almost like this very brief moment in time you become very close, almost as if the two of you understand each other so perfectly. Um, and so I, I oh, this is really interesting. I, I recreate those moments of longing. And I think part of the way this happens is that when someone is standing in front of my camera or sitting or whatever, when someone is in front of my lens, 
I get so, I get so emotionally involved that they become like we start to switch roles. We start to switch all kinds of roles. So like they become when I'm looking at them, they become me as a child. I become me as a child. I become my mother as a child. They become my mother when I was a child. All this stuff starts to happen in front of my lens, and I think it's all that energy that makes that charges my work. And I think it's all that energy that you like. Like if you see these images, especially in real life, they're really they're kind of intense. And I think it's all of those emotions like moving through me. And I, I can do all that with a camera in front of me. I, I can sit there and literally pull all those emotions, you know, out and understand them. And so that's what I mean when I say like I'm photographing from a place of confusion and curiosity and love and pain and pleasure and. Um, because all of that stuff comes out. It's, it's this incredibly amazing process. Um, then just winding down, this is a series I did fairly recently. It's a little bit similar to the Mark of Abel, which was the, the, the very first color series I did. Only this time, in the Mark of Abel, they were all sort of standing there. They were together and yet alone in a way where they were just all kind of... Um, just kind of standing there and not touching. But this time I had them touch. 